I would say good afternoon. This is W4BRU, Bruce McAllister. Uh, on Friday night, the uh, 8th of January, the Richmond Amateur Radio Club had their usual club meeting, and uh, part of the club meeting is always a technical presentation. Um, I did the one this last, uh, uh, this last meeting, and uh, somehow the recording got messed up. It never got out there. We usually put it out on our YouTube channel. So I've already put the, um, the, the slides out there, but the slides are not self-explanatory. So, um, so I'm going to re-record what I can remember of it. It won't be uh, quite like doing it from scratch, but uh, you know, it'll lack a little bit of the, having the other audience members there making comments, but it'll give you the gist of what I said. So, if you want to uh, look at the slides, they are, I'm gonna share the screen, share this screen here. They are on the Richmond Amateur Radio Club, RARCclub.net. And if you look under news and events, you'll come down here to the uh, announcement of the, of the January meeting. And if you click the January meeting, you'll see a description and the ability to click this, this piece right here and actually bring up the slideshow. So that you can do. Uh, when, the, um, when this recording finally gets out there, you'll find it under YouTube RARC channel. You'll see this picture or a picture like it, and it'll say click here, and it'll take you to the YouTube channel where you'll see um, the various months. So that's what I wanted to show you from this. All right. So I'm going to start by telling you about the uh, meeting that the presentation I was doing it is about uh, a relatively new piece of software called HamPy. Um, HamPy, you can see it behind me on that screen, okay, back there. Just to give you a quick introduction, this is my station. Uh, there's my HF transceiver right here, UHF, VHF, uh, switch. Um, have the usual pile of HTs and such right there. Got some uh, stuff I play with, experiment with, but uh, this is my main part. part. Now what HamPi lets you do is take one of these $40 or so uh, HamPi computers and control all this stuff. You can not only control it, you can capture logs from it, you can uh, do digital modes, the whole thing. What's been difficult about people using this is it's not Windows. So you're dealing with a different operating system, a version of Linux. It's called uh, Pi OS now, it used to be called Raspbian. And uh, that's been a problem for a lot of folks because you got to deal with the new operating system. Well, what Dave did when he came up with HamPi, that you see back here, is he put the whole thing together so that all you end up doing is on your computer, you download it and then you etch it or burn it into one of these little guys, little, can you see if you can see it? Little uh, SD card, okay, micro SD card. And you take that micro SD card and you make sure you put it the right way in. Let's see here. Put it in the end, whoops. You start up. <laughs> Can't get it in right. You start up the Raspberry Pi by putting power on it and you come up with what you see in the background. Okay. So I'm gonna switch to some slides to show you kind of what you do and how you do it. So bear with me while I do this little shared screen business here. All right, that's what I was after. By the way, this shows me as Kenneth Leidner. Um, it's actually not Ken. Ken is the treasurer of our club, and he has the credentials for using Zoom. So I am uh, using his credentials to get on to show you this. But I'm actually Bruce McAllister, the guy you see here. 
all right, let's go through the let's go through this and show you what I'm going to show you here. This is the guy that developed it, Dave Slaughter. Um, what he did was he took uh, Raspbian, the Raspberry Pi operating system, and put together about 80 different um, ham radio apps. Now the nice thing about it is you have a complete load, so you don't have to learn the operating system. Basically, what you do is you download um, Pi uh, Ham Pi onto your computer, or Windows, or, or a Linux, or a Mac computer. And then you etch one of these little cards, these little SD cards, which you can do etch it or uh, put an image on it or burn it. There's lots of terms that are used for it depending upon your operating system. But basically you create it as a, as a computer load that can be loaded up on the Raspberry Pi. So you get the operating system, you get all 80 plus applications. There's a support group on a group called Groups.io, which I'll tell you more about. There's a wiki documentation as well as uh, ideas and suggestions and so forth. There are regular updates, and there's also advice on doing backups and such. So, um, here's kind of what it contains. Um, just 80 sort of things, I can't show you everything here, but the ones I enjoy doing are things like the software-defined receivers. Um, one of the nice things about having all 80 of these things, 80 applications on, is you got a whole bunch of different SDR software packages. So if you're playing around with one of these SDR receivers, as I have, you kind of go a little nuts trying to figure out um, which one's going to work. Well, instead of having to load one up, try it, find out it doesn't work, and then, you know, get rid of it, load another one, you got them all here. Crank it up, try it, doesn't work, okay, shut it down, try the next one. It's all right here for you. Um, we have the uh, FL Digi Suites. I happen to be a PSK31 person, and I'm attempting to get into RIDI. I haven't gotten there yet. You've got the digital modes that you think of as FT8 and such. I'm not much for FT8. Uh, I view that as uh, uh, giving the computers too much, letting your, your, running the radio so your computer can talk to somebody else's computer. You know, I think it's just giving the computers a better chance of taking over. That's all. But there is one on there called JSA Call, which uses FT8 type of technology in order to, um, in order to have a QSO. There's a bunch of logging applications. I happen to choose a CQR log. I'll show you that. And a bunch of others as well. Here's what the menu looks like. I can't show you the whole menu because it goes down below you know, what will fit on the screen. But in, 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 any, in any kind of Raspbian sort of thing, you hit the Raspberry and it gives you the list of software. <coughs> and one of the lists in the software categories is hand radio you get this whole list here. Give you an example. Here's um, logging. <coughs> I have tried Xlog, uh, didn't really much like it. Tried CQR log, I really like that. But the point is, you can try whatever you want to, use it for a week or two, see what you think of it, and get rid of it. I also use Trusted QSL, which is basically the logbook of the world. So when you set that up, you can use it with any of the logging programs that support it. Um, the one thing I learned the hard way is before a ham, ham pie came out, I had was setting this up on my own and set up trusted Q, uh, QSL. And then I switched to a different system and did not do a, a an official backup of the certificate for trusted QSL. So I had to go through and get a whole new certificate again. So you might want to consider if you put on trusted QSL, make sure you do a backup in trusted QSL, so that certificate can move to a different system if it needs to. But I use CQR log and trusted, uh, trusted C, uh, QSL for my logbook of the world. An example of what CQR log looks like, um, what I did was, uh, well, okay, when you have it hooked up to your radio, the first thing that happens is it reads the frequency off your radio. And if you have the mode set, it'll, meet, it'll read the mode off. Now you have to type in the RST stuff, and you have to type in the power. But as, as soon as you put in a uh, call sign of somebody, the way I, I, I said, I, to, I told oh, CQR log I wanted to use QRZ, well, it looks up in QRZ. So all the rest of the stuff was filled out by the logging program based on QRZ. Uh, well, time of, time of day, obviously, um, the name of the person, kind of where they are, 
you notice it lighted up a thing that said I need this QSL because I haven't I don't have one for this person gives me some of my DX kind of stuff that I can use um, I'm not a DXer or a contester I tend to to do to um, um, rag shoes so I don't know much about this but the, what I have read is the people who do contesting and um, and DXing find this log program is just fine in terms of giving them what they need, the cues, the ability to log it, the whole business. So this is how CQR log is, what lo it looks like. You can use any of the other log programs as, instead. Here's the FL Digi Suite. Um, I have no, no idea what most of these are. When I first started, I was using FL Rig to be the front end for FL Digi. FL Rig will let you control your radio. You can change the frequency, you can change the modes, the power, a whole bit. And um, and then feed FL Digi. I decided I wanted to have FL Digi send its logs to C CQR logs. So I replaced, I got rid of FL Rig and I went through the process of setting it up so that the two of them, the logging program and FL Digi talk together. It's worked fine for me. Um, I, I do PSK31 a fair bit, a few other things as well. Here's a PSK31 uh, example. Um, I, the way this is set up is actually a browser that sits out here that shows you all the things it's seeing. Um, I was not able to fit that on this on the slide and let you see it again. So, but. Uh, when I pick a frequency, and there's a there's a little bookmark here. If you click that, it'll come out with the standard CW and um, and um, digital frequencies. You double click it, and it pops up the frequency for that particular band as well as the mode, and it tunes your radio. It changes the tuning of your radio to that frequency and that mode. It also sends that information to CQR. We're having a conversation. That, if you use FL Digi, this is no, this is no, no news to you. If you want to have a conversation with this person, you click them. They pop up here with a call sign. You can look them up on um, on the logbook of the world by pushing the, the by pushing this button. And as I say, when you're done with the, with the um, FL Digi, you close it out. All the logs get passed over to CQR log. So here's how they come together. Um, when you're doing uh, FL Digi, you kind of click file on the logging program, CQR log. Say click, I'm running FL Digi. And what that's saying to CQR log is stop looking at my transceiver. Get all your information from FL Digi. If you're running FT8 or FT4, you would click this one. And what that would say to CQR log is stop looking at the radio, get your information from the WSJT. So hopefully that makes sense to you. This is the um, the, the weak signal stuff, uh, um, FT8, FT4, all that sort of thing. The only one I use is JS8 call. Um, this is a picture of JS8 call. Um, it'll let you do one of the things you can kind of do with uh, uh, FT8. I can do a heartbeat and what it does is it sends my heartbeat out and I, I can see who can hear me. Um, I can do a CQ, all that sort of thing. Um, the way this works essentially is, is like FT8, a small packet of stuff that's that's put together. And there's a space for, I believe it's 13 character message. Well, when you type in a message down here and you say send, uh, and say send, what it does is it uses as many FT8-like packets as it needs to send your message. So you'll see five, six, seven packets going out as it sends out your information. Um, you do not get the kinds of distances you get with FT8. Um, I have one hand friend of mine who's contacted Antarctica using F FT8. Well, this doesn't do quite that good of under the noise level sort of thing, but I have it from Richmond, Virginia. I've had very little trouble uh, connecting to the West Coast and uh, up into Canada and down into South America. So it does uh, does better than things like um, PS, uh, uh, PSK31, doesn't do as well as FT8, but it is a QSO as opposed to just a, uh, a, a DXing or contesting sharing of data. Okay, 
let me talk a little bit about the support network. Um, the support ne network uses uh, groups.io. You may know groups.io, you may use groups.io. It kind of replaces the old Yahoo special interest groups. A lot of the old Yahoo stuff has moved over to this. Anyway, you would go to groups.io and you'd say, show me ham pie. And this is what you'd get. And if you look down in, in here, it gives you the information about it. It, uh, it shows you the current release and the new release, which I'm about to put on. I didn't want to jinx this presentation by putting a new version on, so I, I'll wait till this is over. Um, has videos on how to do it, all kinds of interesting detail. So that's kind of where you go to find your information and see how to load it. There's a wiki, includes uh, the documentation, which is pretty thorough. Any outstanding issues, other things like that. So, if you want to load it up and use it, here's what you go through. If you're not already registered on Groups.io, then you go to Groups.io and get a registration. And then you do things like, under Groups.io, you'd say, find HamPy. And when it came up with HamPy, you'd say, I want that to be one of my groups. Okay. Now, what'll happen is it'll, it'll admit you. But it'll admit you under a, um, a cautious sort of moderated deal. It will, uh, it will look you up to see if you really are legitimate. Is there really a ham with this call sign? And do the credentials look right? And when you start um, asking questions or answering other questions, it will put you on hold while it goes out to a moderator. And the moderator will check to make sure you aren't one of these nuts that's going out there and putting junk in the system. As soon as you seem, seem trustworthy, what will happen is it'll stop um, stop moderating you and you go through as usual. Again, you use the videos and such to guide you in the process. And when you have questions, you run into problems, you go out to Group.io and you, ask, you do a search for whatever it is you're looking for, or you ask a question, whatever you need. Okay, having told you about ham pie, I'm gonna to talk to a little bit about the Raspberry Pis in case you uh, want to get one. Um, these are the current active models. The one behind me that I'm using to control it is a Model B. So I bought this, actually my wife bought it for me to play computer with um, a couple, three years back. And um, and I started playing with it with my radios and discovered that I didn't want to mess with it anymore. I didn't want to break anything. I wanted to keep it used. So uh, for my last birthday, she bought me another one I can play with. So the one back there is committed. But, you know, $40 commitment to control my computer. Not bad. These are the newer, this is, these are pretty fast. I have seldom found a problem where uh, I, it couldn't handle it. I did find out that with JS8 call, which is a kind of digital mode in which it's, you know, it transmits for like 15 to seconds to a minute, puts something of a load on the Raspberry Pi as well as your transceiver, where you have to turn the power down on your transceiver. And so I was getting some overheating and low voltage problems which it showed me up on the display. So I put in a slightly larger power supply. I had an old Roku two and a half amp power supply. So I put a new end on that and hooked it up. That solved the power problem. And I went out and bought two heat sinks, which go on these little chips right here, you see. And problem went away, haven't had a problem since. Uh, this is the Model 3, this is the Model 4. It's, it's the speed of a good sized tablet, so it's much faster. Um, uh, I think a lot of hams I know who are going with this are buying the Model 4. I would, I would probably do the same thing myself if I was starting over again. It's about 10 or $15 more, but you know, you're, you're having a, a rig control computer pretty cheap. I said this is 40 bucks, so maybe the 4 is, I don't know, 50 or 60 bucks, right? So you're still talking about pretty inexpensive control computer. Uh, what you use on this are, there are four USB ports. I use three of them. It does Wi-Fi, but I happen to have a uh, Ethernet connection coming to my radio desk, so I just went ahead and plugged that in. This HDMI port goes to an old TV set, and that's what I use for my monitor. And it's a good, big monitor. That's uh, let's, let's shut down over here. For I mean, I, that's like a 27 inch monitor. That's much bigger than my computer stuff. And you can have a lot of real estate out there. You could be having 
CQR log, you've been running a digital mode, you can have a lot of other stuff out there as well. You know, it's nice to have a great big screen to put that on. So HDMI connection, here's where you plug in your five volt power supply, and then that little micro SD card slips underneath that. So that's what you use. This is what my connections look like. I have a USB cable going from my transceiver to the Raspberry Pi. If you have a transceiver that can't do the USB connection, there are several ways to solve it, but probably the easiest one is to get something like Signal Link, hook it up to your computer, and then run it in USB. Here's the HDMI card that goes to my monitor. Power supply. <coughs> Power supply. <coughs> I had an old keyboard and an old mouse sitting around. They cost me nothing. I think I paid $20 for a used TV set, so you know, at this point, I'm under a hundred dollars, and I got a, I got a uh, rig control system. One of the things you do face <coughs> when using any Linux type device is the thing called the terminal, which is the black thing you see down here at the bottom. Essentially, you don't have a couple of hundred million using million people using the operating system. So, so some stuff that would be on Windows or Mac, a nice pretty little screen and GUI, you got to do by typing in. Well, you don't actually type it. I'm not going to type in things like use compressed program, P-I-G-Z hyphen, uh, hyphen C-V-F. What I do is I go out to, uh, in this case, groups I.O. Um, and I look at the upgrade for ham pie and I take my mouse and I scrape this and I copy it. I come down here to the terminal and I click edit and I click paste and it lays the whole thing in the terminal form. I get the enter key and it goes out and runs it. So I don't have to worry about typing anything. I don't know what's what that's all about. I let it do it that way. So you do have to deal with the terminal, but it need not be a big issue for you. Okay, sources of connection advice. Obviously, HamPy and a group IO. Um, you also want to take a look at anything on how to, if you haven't already connected your transceiver to a computer, you're going to look that one up. Um, I found a really good um, set of videos by a guy that's got a K0 call sign. I don't remember the whole thing. He, he gave a really detail on how to, how to set the volume and everything else on your transceiver. Raspberry Pi handles its end of it. You've got to get the transceiver. You want the volume at 50%. You don't want this. You do want that. That information you can get if you look up information on your rig, or if you're using SignalLink, you can look that up and get that squared away. Um, there are some independent things that don't use Group IO, uh, CQR Log and FL Digi, for example, have their own websites. And then for so folks around here, you can always send uh, an email note to me, to, uh, to, to John at KX4QC, or to Russ at W4PGT. There are several things these guys are way ahead of me on. So, but we go back and forth on a regular basis to, 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 to steal ideas off each other. Okay, once you have HamPy installed, you still got to set up the software. This is no different from setting, up, from setting things up for for a ham radio deluxe or N1MM or any of the other things you might use. So here's an example of setting things up for CQR log. One of the things you gotta do is tell it about your radio. Remember this thing is reading out the frequencies from your radio, it's reading out all the other stuff. You gotta give it the information. So um, it turns out that, that Linux, including Raspberry Pi, has this great piece of software called HamLive. And HamLive has this really detailed description of each transceiver. I mean, what commands it takes and what things it'll do and what it'll read back to you, all of that sort of thing. So you click this down arrow here and you go down through a very long list of, of, of rigs until you get to yours and you click on yours. Now, CQR log or anything else you use in the Raspberry Pi that needs to talk to the transceiver has all the detailed information on how to read out and use the transceiver. You do have to give it the COM port. 
Well, they don't call them COM ports in, in, in Linux and uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, and you can, there's a way of looking it up, but almost always, if you only have one rig set up here, it'll be slash DEV -E slash TTY capitalized USB zero. That's the USB connection um, on the Raspberry Pi. So now everything that CQR log needs to control and read off your transceiver is present. Now I am using mine for um, for FL Digi as well. So I set up radio number two, and in this one I give it a what's called ham live dummy. In other words, kind of a generic doesn't do much system because it's going to get its information off FL Digi. And I put in a speed and I say it's going to have a hardware handshake. So now when I go to say I'm running an FL Digi, instead of CQR log is looking at this radio over here, it's going to look at this radio here, and basically read it off FL Digi. Oh, you also have to set up your, your, your uh, system. Nice if you'd spell your name right. And then you have to set up things like, are you going to use uh, QRZ or HAM QTH to look things up? And I put in my name and, and, and uh, password here. So this gives uh, CQR log all it needs to, to uh, control, look up, deal with my transceiver. All right, where do you buy Raspberry Pis? Well, you can certainly buy them off Amazon. And I'm a big Amazon fan, but you sometimes get some stuff that ain't really brand name on Amazon. And the Raspberry Pi people suggest that you buy it from one of these folks that they've checked out and they're reliable. Um, I happen to like Adafruit and Spark Fun particularly, mostly because they have some very, very nice accessories and stuff to experiment with. But any of those will work. I think the one that my wife bought me was she bought it from Bill Ross and that was fine. And you can buy them with power supply, or if you don't have a power supply of your own, you can use that. It needs five volts at two and a half to three amps. Um, you can buy cases or not. So, you know, it's, it's got all that sort of thing. If, you're, uh, if you don't like to deal with women, well, don't buy it from Adafruit because this lady runs Adafruit. She founded it. She's a pretty sharp MIT uh, graduate, engineering graduate. You can see her standing in front of her pick and place machine for doing uh, cards, but Spark Fun is all run by guys. You can pick what you want. Okay, so at this point uh, with the club, I stopped and uh, did uh, questions and answers. Um, so uh, that's obviously not gonna work here. I did have some guys who had already bought Model 4. They were playing with those. They had some good information. I'll give you a little bit of a look over here at what it looks like kind of set up. Um, and you know, it's tough to take a, a screen of the screen, so I'll get this unhooked from my foot. But you can see uh, uh, one, of my, one of my fun things on, by the way, part of this is uh, one called Ham clock, pretty slick. Got stuff on it. I don't even know quite what it means. Takes a second to go out here because it's going out and connecting with space weather and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So let me put it up here in the corner out of the way. <laughs> Looking up a bunch of stuff. So uh, you know, and this is kind of stuff coming over the internet. So really slick, you know, you got the gray line, you got uh, uh, solar fluxes, you've got uh, basically DX um, spotter information showing frequencies and, and where you're getting to at, at various frequencies or various bands. You know, pretty neat. Um, here's CQR log. So 
so you might be able to see the frequency that's showing up here. Let me see if I can stabilize this. Um, I'm accidentally keying my VHF unit. Yeah, this is not very clear. And what you can see, if you could see it, is that as I tune my radio over here, the frequency is changing on CQR log. So anyway, that kind of gives you a little bit of look. Oh. This thing drooping from my chest is the, is the microphone. I knew I was going to be turning around and facing away from you, so I thought I need to do that. All right. So that's uh, what I had to say at the meeting, pretty much. So hopefully this is helpful to you, and you can, uh, you can look at this at your leisure. So thanks for tuning in to uh, Richmond Amateur Radio Club and seeing our presentation. We do these on the second Friday of every month. We start off with a brief 20, 30-minute uh, presentation. Uh, sorry, business meeting. We cover uh, where we are financially. We bring new members in. We do all that sort of thing. And then we go off to a presentation that usually runs 30 to 45 minutes, usually fairly technical. The one last month was on uh, a guy who's a really expert at 5G, talking about how 5G works. And you might want to look at that video. So we have a number of videos out there of these presentations. If you get on the video and you don't care about all the front end business meeting, you can just use the fast forward until you get down to the presentation. So thank you for watching. And I'll say 73, this is W4BRU, out.